Well, good morning. So I want to share some things with you this morning. Um, and yes, Bob, you, just, you woke me up in prayer. Where is Bob? Is he in there? Oh, he's right there. Yeah, that was great. I was like, did I hear that? Um, and just when I was thinking, man, look at these guys go. We have a great worship team, don't we? And Bob's like, Bob, he looks younger than ever up there today. And then... And then. <laughs> uh, so, I think I need to explain a little of this up front. <clears throat> Uh, my message today is a little bit of teaching, a little bit of personal testimony, as I'm starting to be old enough to look back, which frightens me. And I've learned a few things, and it's suddenly realized that um, I'm finally beginning, and this is why I'm picking on Bob, I'm beginning to understand worship a little more. Um, because I've never been a worship guy. I, you know. I know that I have friends that say, well, you disguise that really well. But I don't get up in the morning and go, I want to go to church today, which some of you might do. I never go home from church saying, boy, I'm, I wish I didn't come. But um, I'm the kind of guy who would just as soon worship the Lord with a, in a canoe on a nice lake someplace and let that be my thing. But I'm learning a few things. I'm not where I was. Our verse today, uh, just a jump off point here, is um, Psalm 95. Uh, verse 6 through 7, I think I got 8 up there, maybe accidentally, so don't worry about that. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So I want to look at this today in three, in, in three different ways, and it's going to appear linear but if you don't experience it linear, if you jump in in the middle, or if you start at the end and work to the beginning, it's okay. But for me, it sort of happened like this. So I want to share um, things that I've come to know. Now, what is worship? It comes from the old English, worthship, Giving God his due, his worth. Um, why do we worship? Because he says to? Yes. It always bothered me. I never quite understood why we need to worship God. I think we should acknowledge him. But why does this have to be? Does God have an ego problem? Does God just need for us to tell him how awesome he is? You know, I mean, I have that problem, and I would appreciate kind words later. But God does not, God doesn't need that. You know, I've come to realize this that when we step into worship and know who God is, we step into reality. His ways are real. My ways are not. His ways are real. The world's ways are not. And the closer I get to him, the closer I get to being real. So when we appear to be, well, I'll get there. Let's just start off with, we have to start somewhere with worship. We've got to start somewhere. And I'm going to start at the beginning, right? I'm calling it the I am worship, right? God is, is the one who is. And we worship him because he is our creator, right? We are here because of him, right? Now... Deuteronomy, in the, in the, in the Ten Commandments, it, he's, while he's saying, you know, don't worship any other gods. I'm the, I'm the real God. I'm the one. There are, you have no other gods before me. He prefaces it by saying, I am the Lord, your God. Thank you. I am the Lord, your God. So the hint from the very beginning is it's personal. It's very personal. Yet we begin to experience God in many ways in an impersonal fashion. We experience him through his creation. Right? We see this world we live in, the glorious mountains that we can visit close by. We have the seashore close by. We're pretty lucky here in our geography because we get to experience a lot of what the earth has to offer glimpses of God's glory. Right? We get to see the crashing surf, the majestic mountains, um, 
we avoid things like the earthquakes and the t tornadoes here, which is another good uh, benefit of, of living in New England. But we experience God through his creation. We get to know him because we know it came from somewhere and we came from somewhere. In spite of those who would suggest that things come from nothing, um, I haven't found that to be true yet. So, back to worship. As we see God in the physical world, he hints at there's something else, this connection he wants to have with us, this personal connection. He says in Psalm 103, he says, you know, Psalm 103 says, it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. So we come to this understanding that God made me. That comes with certain things attached to it. If God made me, and I really love the not we ourselves, which is not in every, um, every manuscript, but the Jewish Septuagint, the LXX, holds to it, that we don't make ourselves. And never before in history have we lived in a time where people are so intent on inventing themselves when God calls us to discover ourselves that he has made us to be something to begin with. And so we start with this physical thing. We showed up in this body. How lucky am I to get this one? Um, I can barely see over this. But, and it's tougher the greenhouse trying to hang up those hanging baskets. I could have used a couple more inches. But we, we, got, we start somewhere. Our worship is physical. We worship here physically. We show up at a place, we sit in the chair, we stand up. Some of us raise our hands a little bit. I always wanted to try this in the church. Anybody go to Fenway Park? Anybody been to Fenway Park? Anybody do the wave at Fenway Park? Can we try that? Can we try that over here? All right, over here and work this way. Can we try that? Let's give it a shot. Let's just see. Ready? Derek, go. The wave. Yay! That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Also, that's the most people I've ever seen raise their hands in worship in this church since I've been coming here. Um, thank you. I, 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 always been in the back of my mind, mind to pull that off. All right, so he didn't make, uh, he made us, we don't make ourselves, we don't get to invent ourselves. We get to find him and know who we are. Our identity doesn't come from trying to make something up and the pressure we put on kids now is horrific, um, trying to figure out who they are, what they are. Um, you can't know who you are until you know who made you. You cannot. So we get closer to worship as we understand God is our creator and we realize that if he's our creator, there's some authority that, that we need to acknowledge that he has, that we need to get closer to his ways. Now, sometimes our our self-awareness, our own sin that we know we carry around, blocks us from thinking God wants to be close to us. And we'll cover more of that in a minute. But I just want to start with this. I just want you to realize God is the one who's always reaching out to us, right? It wasn't Adam, after he sinned in the garden, who went looking for God, saying, God, where are you? Right? It was God coming after Adam. Right? We see the prodigal son story where the father is looking for the son to come back. We see, I just, I love the story of the apostles didn't go up to a telephone pole and pull off a little tag to say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this number and follow Jesus. Right? Jesus went after them individually, called them to follow him. Right? There was a personal reaching of God to man. God's always reaching out to us. Sometimes we have a problem with that. Um, but I want to go back to this physical thing for just a minute. We were built physically to worship, and we do that in our church. We don't have kneelers in our church. Maybe we should, because there's a lot of stances of, of kneeling, and we're told every knee will bow before Christ. Um, but physically, we're meant to worship. I know some of you in this room know what BDNF is, right? You don't have to raise your hands. BDNF. It's a thing. All right? It's brain-derived neurofactor. Brain-derived neurofactor. Now, studies have been done, 
and I was reading this study in, in the um, National Library of Medicine online, it was fascinating. A study was done that people who worship God, their brain changes. Things happen on the inside of our brains that we produce more of this BDNF, which has some nice benefits for us. Um, people who have higher levels of BDNF are less prone to depression and more resilient when they fall into it. They bounce out quicker. I love the word resilient, right? They snap back quicker. Now, we don't want to worship just for the benefits like that. Um, the BDNF thing is real in us. And it leads me somewhere. I'm trying to read through the report was horrific, though. It, we, you had to walk, water through, wander through the Duke Religiosity Index, which is a thing. And I read through this whole thing, which I didn't understand the words or the symbols, but I kept reading. The only word I understood in the study was horseradish. <laughs> and I, I just got to share that because it was worth the whole read. But it was, it was in this. It was, they assayed the results in a streptodiavidin horseradish peroxidase conjugate solution to find that our brains respond to worship. Which tells me what? For the purposes of today, it tells me that we're physically built to worship. It's built into us. Our bodies respond when we worship God because we were meant to. We were made to. Now, Tim Keller taught me a couple of things. And Tim Keller was the author, uh, pastor, who was New York's pastor for many years, passed away recently. One of the things that he got me to break out of was this idea of this grid of reality. Right? We view the world through a grid of reality. Look at our window grills here. They're a sort of a grid which we see reality outside. Right? Our realities are shaped by our culture, for us, our media, our TV, uh, what we grew up with, uh, how we see and think are seen through these grids that we've been fed in our particular time period. It changes regularly. Right? We're old enough, most of us here now, to go, well, in my day, we wouldn't put up with this. Right? Yes, we are. Right? It changes. But as we get to begin to worship God as our creator, we start to realize there is a change-less grid. There's a, there's a stability. There's things that don't change. And when we put him first, when we begin to elevate him in our minds and our hearts, things begin to change where we realize what he thinks matters more than the world around us, which is changing continuously. Um, we see this through the things God has made. It's a grid of God's stuff. All right. Page two of six. Three of them I left home. All right, so my next stage was the worship. I started with worship I am, but now worship I am not. One of the definitions I read of worship was this. The practice of getting together weekly and not being God. The practice of not being God. All right, letting God be God. That's a tricky thing, right? Because our, our ideas of who God is can be fuzzy. We can shape them as, you know, through what we see. We can shape them a little bit through the people we meet. Um, but we have to get to know God ourselves. ourselves. We have to. Many of you are familiar with the passage in Isaiah 6 where Isaiah meets God, right? Yeah, it's a thrilling, exciting experience, right? Isaiah is suddenly thrust into the throne room of God, uh, and his experience leads him to scream out, Woe is me. I am undone. Right? I am a sinful man in a place where sin is not accepted. Um, we talked about Jesus calling the apostles, right? Peter, Peter gets it right. Jesus goes to call Peter and he says, get away, I'm a sinful man. Right? We know that there's things in us that are not acceptable to God, yet he still loves us. He's still reaching out for us. He still made a way for us. I'm not sure what I think about the pretty flowers, Mary Sill. <laughs> Easter was beautiful. But the, Ross, the cross is still old and rugged for me. Um, yes, there are some things I should think and not say. 
That's why, that's why I'm not up here professionally, right? <laughs> yeah. Part of my job is to make you guys feel way better about yourselves. All right. We know that we're, we got an issue. We got problems. Mary, you're going to make me laugh now. We have problems before God, but yet God wants to. He wants to bring us back to him. He has made the way with, with Jesus on the cross. And he doesn't ask much from us, except for everything. right? But he asks simply that we be humble about ourselves and say, okay, I get it. I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. He asks us to believe that he sent his son to die for us. He asks us to stand up for that, to say yes, to tell other people, I believe. Those are the kind of principles that are in scripture that tell us how we move from just worshiping God because we think he is to because he loves me. When we understand that he sent his son to die for me. And while this isn't in my notes, I want to, I want to share that. Um, sinner's prayers. You've all heard sinner's prayers, right? There's all kinds of them. You know, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive my sins. I will follow you. I trust in you. Amen. Those things are, they're good. But I just want to share my favorite one because it was a turning point <clears throat> that matters here. A friend of mine struggling with whether or not Jesus is the son of God, whether any of this is real and whether he should worship God at all. And at the time, he was working at a hippie farm, and he was working a rototiller, and he rototilled two acres of a field. When he got done, he went to go get in his old Ford pickup truck, and he didn't have his keys. And the only place he'd been all day is in the two acres of field, rototilling. The whole time he's wrote it till, and he's, he's wrestling with these thoughts of his parents about whether Jesus is the Son of God and whether he should touch God. So he comes up with this grid in his mind, and he starts marching up and down the field every which way. Of course, he's turning the field over as he goes. So everything on the top is now on the bottom. But he's going back and forth, and the whole time he tells me, I'm wrestling with this idea of God and Jesus and whether I can trust Jesus with myself. He gets back and forth. The sun's getting low. He's ready to give up, and he finally says, that's it. I'm going to pray. He said, I closed my eyes. I bowed my head. I said, Lord, if this is real and if I can trust Jesus, help me find my keys. He said, Before he unbowed his head, he opened his eyes and right between his right foot and his left foot for his keys. His response to God was this. You were right. I was wrong. That's in his prayer. <laughs> contained everything necessary, right? Everything necessary was right there. So pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, you are right. I was wrong. Amen. If you meant that, that might mean something. Things might change. You might see things in a, in a little different ways because when we turn our life over to Jesus, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, what? He says, anyone in Christ is a new creation. Right? The old has passed away. Everything becomes new. So now when we come to worship, the reality shifts again. Right? We go from just um, knowing that there's something to start to understand God's ways. We start to understand who he is. But we have to go through processes. And our worship helps us in this. When we close our eyes and we pray, when we close our eyes and we sing, or have our eyes open and sing, God will show us things. Sometimes awesome things about how much he loves us, how much he cares for us. Sometimes terrifying things about things that need to change in our lives and things that we need to do differently. These are revealed to us when we worship him altering our reality, right? I see this phrase, and for me it was you know, Psalm 51.10, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit in me. You know, there's a time of healing and cleansing that happens and can only come in worship, can only come in worship when we're connected with God. And it's amazing. Sometimes, for me, the moment of worship is a moment, that moment of pure connection is a, a second for you guys, but for me it might feel a lot longer. 
Um, there's just a moment where God speaks. God does something. God shifts something. Something changes. I had it happen this week. Something you would never understand if I told you. But my mind just shifted about something um, in an instant. I felt at peace about something that I was not at peace about at all because I knew the way he wanted me to go. We go through this. There's, there are layers of cleansing that has to happen and changes that has to happen that, that are revealed in worship. And, you know, we talk about, like, the big three of worship, prayer, our congregational singing and uh, and Bible reading. They will all change once you get to know Jesus. They will grow deeper, more meaningful, more powerful, and sometimes a little more scary. Uh, your prayer will become honest. It has to. Because you can't hide from a God who you know is there. Your prayer, And when you're honest before God, he can do great things. Honesty matters. Honesty changes our hearts and, and improves our connection with him. And our prayer will also start to shift this way. We won't just be talking all the time. We'll be listening. Because some of the most important things, well, maybe the most important thing prayer can do is prepare us to hear what he has for us. Your Bible will become different. The reality of a book will change. I was thinking about this, how, you know, we call the Bible an instruction book. And there's some truth to that. But I'm more inclined to think of it now as a YouTube video. Right? I recently changed all my heaters in the greenhouse. And I have one broken. There's these new kind of heaters. I have no idea how to fix them. What am I going to do? I looked at the instruction book, and this is like this. is not helping me. It's cold, and it's incomplete. It doesn't give me enough information. I go onto a YouTube video and this guy from Alabama starts telling me how to fix my Modine heater. And he takes me through every circuit on the Modine heater and every safety switch and everything I need to know to fix my heater. His heaters were old, ugly, and rusted, but it didn't matter. I had a person helping me through step by step to get me where I had to go to find my igniter shorting out before it would let the gas come. All right. A person, anybody like YouTube videos for fixing things? Um, yeah. All right. A person talks to you. When you read your Bible, you will find a person talking to you. All right. Um, the grid of reality changes. All right. We don't just see God through his stuff he made. Now we start to see God through his ways. Right? How God works, how he moves, how he works in us, how we respond to him. Right? The grid gets uh, denser and deeper, uh, stronger for us, as we see reality change for us. I love, um, the chron I read all the Chronicles of Narnia back in the day. Uh, my favorite was the, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Maybe some of you have seen it, read it or not. But at the crux of the story was um, this kid named Eustace, right? And Eustace was a jerk. And nobody liked him, and they shouldn't like him because he was a totally unlikable kid. And through a series of events, he becomes physically a dragon, turns into a dragon. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie and you don't want to know what happens next, you can leave. I'll give you one, two, okay. So, as the story goes on and Eustace is a dragon and figures out he's a dragon, doesn't know what, what he's going to do about being a dragon, um, he's met up with... A lion. And if you know the story, you know who the lion is. Aslan. He's the Christ figure. And Aslan leads useless, you, useless, Eustace. <laughs> oh, he was useful as a dragon because he could start fires for him. He could, he could fly around and check things out. Um, but Eustace was led by Aslan the lion to a pool where he was instructed to bathe. And as he bathed, his dragony scales fell off. And the things that made him prickly and unlikable and unlovable to others fell off. But when he climbed out of the pool, it started to come back again. And he had to go back in. And more fell off. And the process repeated himself. I saw that as a picture of, of the reality of worship. That every time we come and worship God with, our, with a whole heart, things are going to fall off. Scales and crustiness, stuff of our old life that's not helping anyone fall off. Eustace, 
um, eventually gets to the point where he's a boy again. His dragonness falls off completely. I found out afterwards, I, I looked up the story again, um, I didn't realize that his last, I'm, I'm sure C.S. Lewis intended this, his last name was Scrub. Eustace Scrub, who had to take a bath, right, in a healing pool. I'm never comfortable with notes, but as I get older, they're helpful. <laughs> what was that guy's name again? Oh. Next, that, okay, our final. I'm, I'm not quite bringing it in for a landing. Have we heard that one before? However, um, our worship leads us to a newer place, a deeper place. Once we start to get cleaned up and we become a boy again, as it were, um, we experience God in a redemptive way. Worship is redemptive. All right? And I'm not talking about our personal redemption. We kind of covered that in the last part. I'm talking about outward. Things begin to change. Our views of things change. Our views of people change. The Spirit of God begins to work in us and change in us. Things will change in size and shape. That which was big and scary might become small and meaningless. Right? Those things that we worried about we might not worry about because we've experienced God. We sang that song. I love that song. I trust in God. You know, I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. We start to experience it. We sing it over and over again because, because we experience it over and over again. We experience, oh, God saved me from this. God protected me in that. God provided for me here. God took care of me there. Our hearts begin to change even more as we get closer to him. Um, some things that were small in our life might grow. Our level of compassion and love for others. Our level of being able to uh, care for other people besides ourself, that might grow significantly. I'm telling you, it will grow significantly the more you worship God and get to know him. Things will just look different in a growing Christian walk where you are worshiping God. Example, you know, we're gonna need, as we grow, God will trust us with more, and we're gonna need strength for tasks and strength for tests. We go through things. If you haven't noticed, things come our way that we don't welcome, we don't want. But God may want us to go through them anyway. I call on Jesus here because he experienced this, right? We just, we just went through Good Friday two weeks ago. Right? Jesus was in the garden. He had a task to do. It was a test for him. He didn't want to. I love that about Jesus, that there's a human part of Jesus that w wanted to protect himself, but he also knew what his father was calling him to do, and the, it hung in the balance. The fate of our lives and our eternities hung in the balance. Which way was Jesus going to go? What does Jesus do when he's stuck in this? Does he consult all his friends? No. He prays. He goes into worship, and out of that, he finds the strength from his Father to do the things he's called to do. So out of our times in worship where we, where we, <clears throat> our vision starts to expand, we start to see things differently. We start to desire things differently. Things that we wanted before go away. All of a sudden, our minds are filled with new thoughts of new ideas. Missions and ministries start popping up. How can I help? What can I do? I see people who need. How can I help with that need? These things come out of our time spent with God. Right? I, I, I just love our church because we have a zillion little ministries in this church. People want to serve God. And I know what that comes out of. We go from seeing God as, as our creator. We, we find him um, in his ways through the things that he shows us is right and wrong, kind of. But he takes us to a place different. He takes us into a place, our grid of reality now is seeing through God's own heart. What does God love? What is God into? What does he want to do in this world and the people around me? And suddenly we want to get on board. We're excited about it. And I see that in our church with so many people. It just, it blesses my heart to see. <clears throat> Matthew 5, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Nobody puts that on their refrigerator. We should, but we don't. <laughs> but in that passage, as the passage 
as Jesus explains this stuff. He says, you know, your heavenly father loves everybody and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. And he says at the end, he says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Right? Accurate translation, poor interpretation on our part. The word perfect does not mean moral perfection. It, that, that, that verse has driven people into despair many times. No, I like how Eugene Peterson in the message has it. If I was, had more time, I knew Kevin was going to sit there. I would have him look it up. But Eugene Peterson translated this way. He says, grow up. It's not be for perfect. Grow up. Be mature. Be, grow up this way. You're a child of God. Grow up and be like your father. You know, I know a lot of us heard those words from my mom, and it didn't mean a good thing, right? You're just like your father. No. <laughs> no. Be like your heavenly father, because he loves all and, and will reach all, and, and he wants to use you in the process. I'm going to leave you one more thing. <clears throat> George MacDonald was a fantasy writer uh, in the 1800s, wrote a lot of children's books, he said, and books for people with childlike hearts. He was considered the, um, the progenitor of all the fantasy writers, had a strong effect on J.R.R. Tolkien, for instance. Um, in one of the intros to his book, he had this in it. And if I can say it right, it will be the last miracle I need today. He wrote a book, called, I believe it was The Princess and the, hmm? not The Princess and the Pea. No, 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 it's it far worse than that. Uh, but I'm, I'm just not getting the right word. Oh, the Princess and the Goblin. The Princess and the Goblin. In the beginning, he, he has an argument in the preface with the author and uh, another person off stage before he starts the book. And he says, this book is written for princesses, for all the princesses out there. And the author says, the, the antagonist says, well, there aren't that many princesses. And he's like, what do you mean? There's lots of princesses. The author asks the antagonist, how do you define a princess? Well, she must be the daughter of a king. And the author says, exactly. The world is full of princesses. And I'm writing this down and saying this today because I'm afraid that they will forget their rank and live beneath their calling. Okay. So I take us back to the very beginning where we find God and we find our identity in him. Right. We are all sons and daughters of the king. We need to engage with our God. We need to worship him, and we'll find out so much more about him and ourselves than we ever could imagine. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father God, I thank you that you loved us so much, that you loved us so much to call us to worship you, that you would have opportunity to reveal yourself to us. I pray that every heart in this room today would sense your nearness, know your closeness, want to come closer in and know you better. I pray you jar us in. Thank you for loving us, for saving us, and for every good gift. In Jesus' name, amen.